位置不是什么东西吗？Sunday night.
Yeah, I have a whole bunch of shelves there. When you photo it, it's just knowing that. 
When your weapons melted. Oh, pyrex, your pyrex melted. Yeah. Yeah. We had some ceramic things that survived semi-survived that sort. I mean they're fire in their creation. Yeah, I guess they can they can handle it. So You saw it coming? Yeah. And that's when you're about an hour to the direction. I didn't get it. Yes. You didn't get it. Oh my God. And then I think it would say it's an evacuation get out. Is this your phone? I just get the oh, no, I just want to make sure. I assumed it was yeah. yours, but I wasn't sure. Good afternoon, everyone. Can everyone hear me all right? It's kind of weird having the microphone so far away, but I can kind of hear myself. So um, my name is Josh Kirpies. I'm the district director for assembly member Richard Bloom. I want to uh, uh, come and welcome all of you on his behalf. Uh, we also have staff here from our office, uh, Tim Pershing, who many of you know, senior field representative in our office. And out front, uh, you met Melissa Koffler, uh, who put this event together. And I just want to say thank you for all of you who are uh, here this afternoon. We uh, partnered with the Contractor State Licensing Board uh, to put on this event many times in the past. We've, we've contracted together, or we've contracted, we've uh, partnered together on events such as Senior Scam Stopper events in your communities, um, uh, where we uh, identify known scams that are happening in the area and uh, share those with um, mostly seniors because they're the, usually the number one targets. Um, but this time, because of the fires that occurred, uh, we wanted to work with the contractors licensing board and kind of still filling you in on some of the scams, but also more broadly and more specifically to the fire uh, and the issues that, that you uh, will be faced or have faced and will continue to face. Uh, and through um, participation by the uh, city and the county, um, we thought we would expand the event a little bit more than just uh, that focus and uh, to be able to answer some of the questions you might have um, that haven't been answered uh, at other events or uh, maybe were answered at other events but you just weren't able to attend. So um, I really appreciate everyone uh, attending. One of the things that our office does, you know, there's not a whole lot, um, as you know, during the fire, it's, it's mainly uh, get out safely. Um, there's not a whole lot our office uh, can do during those times of emergency. Uh, our office plays a role in planning for future um, uh, preventing uh, such things from happening again or uh, preparing ourselves for uh, our communities so that we can uh, better handle it in the future uh, and to learn from each of the the incidents that occur. Uh, we are learning a lot here um, in Malibu um, and what you're facing. Uh, we uh, one of the things that we do try to do though that uh, to help our communities is to bring state services and uh, down from Sacramento or wherever their agencies are, um, bring them here into your community so you can learn about uh, what resources may be available, what information we can share. Uh, our office is always open um, to, uh, if you have any issues or questions um, regarding a state agency or uh, any governmental agency, I say, and we will put you in, in contact with the right uh, agency whether that's uh, state, county, or local uh, city. Um, but you're in good hands here in Malibu. Uh, your leadership uh, of the, or the council um, and the city manager have taken a, uh, been great leaders in moving this community forward. Um, we know there's a lot of work still to come, uh, and uh, hopefully the information today will be helpful to you, and please share it um, uh, with your friends and neighbors. 
Uh, we're going to go through, as you received an agenda when you came in today, hopefully, did everyone receive agenda at the table back there? If not, we can pass some out. But um, we're going to uh, have a few presentations today, and then uh, we will have all the panel members, including the representative from FEMA, who will be uh, here as a panel to answer all your questions at the end. So just write down your questions. We're going to go through the presentations real quickly, and then we'll have lots of time at the end to get questions answered. All right. So right now, I just want to uh, uh, welcome uh, Rick Lopez from the Contractor State License Board, and I'll let him take it over. Thank you. Thanks, Josh. On behalf of the Contractors Board, I'd like to uh, also welcome you and thank you for being here. We know that it's a you know, it, you're sort of still towards the beginning parts of a very long process. And if there's none other than one takeaway that you take from here today is to understand that you're not alone. There are a lot of local, state, federal agencies that are all here to help you. So whenever you've got a question, whenever there's a concern, something you're not sure about, don't feel like you got to figure it out on your own. Take advantage of the resources. A little later when I, uh, I'll talk specifically about uh, the process of hiring a contractor, some of the services that we have available through our website to check out license statuses to actually identify potential contractors. We'll go through all that just so make sure you've got the handout that says at the top, rebuilding after a natural disaster. We'll kind of touch on that lately. So again, thank you for being here. Uh, we look forward to answering your questions a little bit later and making sure you leave here today with, uh, with all the information you need at this stage of the process. And so what we're gonna do though is we're gonna start with the local officials that can talk specifically about things happening here in Malibu. And, and for those of you who might be outside the incorporated, in the unincorporated parts of the county, we have representatives from the county here as well. So I'd like to welcome up Andrew Sheldon to our first presentation. All right, welcome everybody. The Woolsey fire was devastating to, to the entire area and, and really humbling for the community and for city staff and for the county as well. Uh, an event of such, such awesome magnitude um, really makes us all feel small uh, in comparison to the forces of nature. And um, it really presented us with, with a, a challenge we hadn't seen before to get uh, a number of homes put back uh, into productive use, uh, properties, families, back onto their land. And um, so we here at the city of Malibu, and I know our partners at Los Angeles County have really dedicated ourselves to trying to make what is a complicated permitting process as simple and straightforward as possible. And we've really gone back and essentially tried to re-engineer what we can in terms of the, the bureaucracy and the red tape of being able to get these plans approved so that permits can be pulled by your licensed contractors. The focus of, of the meeting today is for contractors and homeowners to understand the requirements for contractors and building your homes. Uh, in order to get to the point where, where those permits can be pulled by your contractors, there, there is a permitting process and a design process. And um, I'm here to talk about that uh, for the city and my counterparts with LA County are here to speak about that for the unincorporated portion of the county. Uh, for people who don't already know this, the, the Woolsey fire spanned two jurisdictional areas. Um, the unincorporated LA County, which is basically back behind the, the front coastline here in, into the Santa Monica Mountains, and the city of Malibu. And each of these jurisdictions has separate planning, zoning, and building departments from each other. And while the general processes of what happens in each of those departments is similar, there are some differences that, that are important to be mindful of. And as you hire design professionals to work with uh, in putting together your plans and your contractors for building them, it is important that everyone involved in your rebuild process be cognizant of which jurisdiction they're in at a particular time uh, so that they follow the local rules. So uh, there's a number of different ways to break this down, but um, what I'm going to do over the next several minutes is give a condensed version of a presentation I gave a few weeks ago at another workshop that went into a lot more detail on everything I'm going to talk about. Uh, and essentially what it is is the roadmap to getting you folks to where you can pull your permits, where you have approved plans and, and what that process involves. 
Um, the county has their own version of it. So again, like I said, there's, there's different ways to skin the cat. For us here in Malibu, we're looking at it as essentially a three-step process. The first step is what can I build? The second step is how can I build it? And the third step is construction, actually doing the building. In the first step, what can I build? That's essentially working with the planning department of the city uh, who is looking at your preliminary plan, seeing where you wanna place the rebuilt structure, how tall it is, how many square feet it is, um, is it in the same location as the original structure? Is it, is it bigger, has it moved? Does it encroach on any um, sensitive resources? Um, and it's very important to do that up front with them because depending on the answers to those questions, the type of clearance you need from planning differs. And for people who are in a hurry to get back onto their property as fast as possible, it's really important to know which track you're taking. The fast track process that we've spent a lot of time putting together is essentially a like kind replacement where the building you're gonna put back is no greater than 10% more in square feet than the building it's replacing. The height doesn't exceed um, 18 feet. Uh, it's not making any non-conforming setbacks to property lines, uh, to the front yard, to things like that, any more non-conforming than it was. And um, a few other things that uh, you'll need to meet with our planning staff to get the details on. But essentially, the key takeaway is that it's a like kind replacement. Um, when you're meeting with the planning department in this step one, what can I build? They are gonna send you around to a number of different internal city departments and external agencies that all eventually have to sign off on your proper your project as you go through the design process so that's going to be our environmental health office that looks at your septic system capacity in malibu nearly all of the homes are on septic systems we have a small minority of homes that are served on a public sewer um, you're going to go to a geology and geotechnical review you're going to go to a public works review and you're gonna to go to a fire department review. Uh, Geology and Geotechnical is looking at your foundation design requirements. Public work is looking at drainage and impact on public facilities. And the fire department is looking at fire code compliance, um, things like uh, fire sprinklers, your um, access, uh, and um, your fuel modification. Uh, whether you need to do something with all the, the vegetation growth that's built up around the house. So that's essentially step one. Step two, how can I build it, is what we call building plan check. Once you've come up with a conceptual plan, this is where you get your design professionals to draw up architectural plans, structural plans, a drainage plan, um, have your wastewater professionals produce a plot plan showing your septic system uh, and its capacity to serve the building. And the key thing is these plans are gonna be submitted for re reviews by each of the agencies and ultimately need to get stamped approved by each of these different agencies that I mentioned. In addition to those, uh, our building plan check engineers check it for compliance with the construction codes. So in Malibu, we're using the um, 2017 Malibu building code, uh, residential code, et cetera. Those are in our municipal code. Essentially, they are the LA County construction codes adopted with just a few local amendments. Um, not time here to get into details on that, but um, your design professionals do need to be aware of which code cycle they're designing to. Um, again, those plans all need to synchronize with the sometimes um, conflicting and intention requirements of the different agencies. So. I liken it to a Rubik's Cube, if anyone remembers what those are, where you're trying to meet several constraints all at the same time, and once you solve one, you find out that it took you out of conformance with a different one. For this reason, working closely with the city, um, coming in, meeting with our professionals here at City Hall, at the fire rebuild table, and at our agency help desks for each of the departments I mentioned, is really critical. Um, to get through the process as quickly and expeditiously as possible, understanding what the requirements of these agencies are, not just for the homeowner, but for each member of the design team 
and for whoever's coordinating that design team as the lead design professional to put everything together so that it's in synchronization. Um, one thing we did here uh, at the city is in re-engineering our system, we used to put you through two loops. The first loop was in planning. You would come in and do this conceptual review with all the agencies and actually have to get some level of a, a written sign off for the in concept plan. And then once you got to there, you would go into the building plan check process and go back around and meet all the conditions that were set during the first review. After those two loops, you could then pull your permits. What we've done now for these like kind replacements is collapsed everything into a single loop. And while on one hand, this provides a tremendous opportunity to save lots and lots of time in getting you to, uh, on your calendar, a time when you can pull the permits, it does put a lot of responsibility back on the design professionals to make sure these different pieces are coordinated. The two loop process was sort of self-correcting in a way by telling you your conditions you had to meet when you went into the final design loop. This time around, you're gonna get through the planning process up front without having to get formal sign-offs from those agencies. And you're gonna have to really get it right the first time around in the one loop uh, for building plan check. So that was, uh, the second step, how can I build it? Getting all of your plans approved by all of the agencies. Again, it's gonna be building plan check. Your hub is gonna be here at Malibu City Hall at the building permit desk upstairs. Um, they're gonna route you around to the other agencies. Fire department, public works, geology, environmental health. And in some cases, you're gonna to have to go back to planning for a final conformance check. Once you have those plans approved with the stamps on, on the sheets, you can come in for permit issuance. Um, our permit technicians are here at Malibu City Hall. Uh, they sit upstairs. Uh, one of them's here today. She's in the back. Julie Bauer is in the red shirt. Um, you'll come in with your approved plans. Uh, typically, if, if it's for an entire rebuild of a house, you're gonna make an appointment with them for the afternoon where your general contractor can sit down and take the time to issue all the various permits that go along with the reconstruction of that house. Um, and again, they are gonna be the clearinghouse checking that all those approval stamps are in place. So um, very important that before you start building, you have those approved plans and, and your permits in place. Uh, we have already encountered a few people that started some rebuilding uh, without permits, and we've had to issue some stop work notices. We have a code enforcement department that uh, can, can assist with uh, making sure that stays in check, but uh, here in Malibu and in the county as well, it's uh, imperative to have these approved plans and permits in place before you start rebuilding. So um, I am gonna be available at the end to answer any additional questions. Um, at this time, I'm going to pass it along to the next speaker on the agenda. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Eric Rodriguez. I don't think, do I need that? No. Nope. Okay. It's not too many of you. So I'm here with the debris removal team from LA County. And so... I hope most folks here are um, most of the way through this process that I'm gonna describe um, in brief, believe, <laughs> believe me, I'm gonna be brief about it. But um, my, my hope is that most of you are um, pretty much resolved in, in those debris removal efforts and can move forward. Um, but I am here to help, my team is here to help. Um, if you do have questions, we're here to answer whatever, whatever, you, whatever we can do to help right now get you moving forward. Um, that's our goal is to, to help everybody get moving forward. And so I want to keep this brief. I know there's a lot of things that everybody wants to cover. And so just in, in, in brief, um, my name is Eric Rodriguez. I'm with LA County Public Works uh, Environmental Programs. And we are administering the debris removal cleanup efforts uh, per the county's health ordinance. All structures that were destroyed by the fire are, are required to be cleaned up in an environmentally responsible manner. And so there are two ways of doing that. There is either you can enroll in the state's debris removal program. And that, that's also through us, you uh, submit applications through us. And by the way, if, if you know somebody who still hasn't signed up, 
they can come and see us. Tell them to see us, your neighbors and friends. If they're still on the fence, we need to get this resolved and clean up for everybody's sake. So there's a state program and there's a, a county way. If people don't want to participate in the state program, they can have their private contractors clean it. Um, in that way, you have to have an approved work plan to ensure that the property is being cleaned up to the same standards as established by the health officer's ordinance. And so uh, in total, we have about 1,200 properties. About 1,200 properties have signed up either one or the other. And about 800, 66%, uh, about 800 signed up for the state, about 400. And this is like, like Andrew said, um, for the entire Woolsey area, including Malibu, unincorporated, a couple little cities on the other side, even, even Ventura County, right? Um, and it, but in total, about 1,200, uh, 800, 400. And so either, either path at the end, they get to the same result, a clean property ready to rebuild. So how do you know you're ready to rebuild? And, and basically you're gonna get a certification letter, a final sign off from the county. It's all gonna come from environmental, from us, from environmental programs division. Either saying the state has given final sign off on your property, you're good to go, or the county has received your soil, your soil results, public health has reviewed them and approved them, um, whatever your, your final determination on your foundation, if you're gonna keep it and you've worked with your building official to, to get that all resolved. And then we, we approve and we issue a final sign off uh, in, in either case. And so that's what you're looking for to rebuild. But it's my understanding, I'm not a building official. These guys are here to handle the rebuilding part of things. But it's my understanding that you don't have to wait for our final sign off to start working on your plans and start getting your, getting, getting your affairs in order. So that once you do get this final sign off, you can kind of hit the ground running. So that's what we we'll kind of recommend. We, we, like I said, we really want to encourage people, you know, to, to get this cleaned up and to, to let's, let's help them move on. All right, so we're here to help. We're here and if, like I said, if there's anybody out there that you know that needs help doing this debris cleanup, we're here to help. So and we have a phone number, we have a website, but um, if you take it down, we have a hotline number, 626-979-5370. Uh, all the information is available on the LA County Recovers website. Uh, even, even information regarding rebuilding is also there. Uh, assistance is also there. If people need help. Resources are available. That's our that's our uh, our dashboard, our tool tool chest, and, and all the services are are there for people for, to help people. So, if you have any questions regarding debris removal, any issues along those lines, I'm here to help, and we'll get we'll do our best to resolve our issues. And with that, I'll pass it along to my counterpart. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eric. Uh, just wanted to see a hand. My name is Juan Madrigal. I'm with Public Works LA County. Just wanted to see a hand, uh, the number of people that are in the unincorporated area. Okay, a lot of you, thank you. Uh, just wanted to make sure that, as, as uh, Andrew was saying earlier, that uh, the city and the county have joined together to, to partner and have the same policies whether it's uh, the demolition policies, whether it's the uh, recertification of the slabs. So we wanna make sure that we're all, we all have the same, same, uh, same brochure, brochures, same type of, uh, of, uh, of messaging now to, to the people, whether they're the, in the unincorporated area or the county. Uh, a lot of the things that Eric uh, spoke earlier about uh, the unincorporated area county is also has the same similar process. What we have on our website, is, and as Eric mentioned too, uh, we have a, a road to rebuilding website that really shows six milestones. Uh, all the information is over here to my right. Uh, but in the first milestone, as Eric talked about, the clearing of the debris. I know most of you are in phase two, whether you opted out or opted in. So one of the things I just want to uh, clarify what Eric said is that, that you're ready for rebuild once uh, phase two is cleared. Well, ready for 
permit is really, as, uh, as uh, also Andrew mentioned, it's really the clearinghouse through building safety. So once building safety has all the agency approvals, fire, planning, close also uh, the debris removal, that's when we'll issue the, the building permit to move forward. So as, as I outlined here that there's six milestones uh, for, for the rebuilding process. The first milestone, of course, is the clearing of the debris. Uh, the second one is financing. Some some people may may have that need of of uh, still needing uh, financing. So we have insurance, we have uh, government assistance, and community partnerships in our website uh, if if that's uh, needed. We also have FEMA brochures on our website if you want to look at that. As well as uh, we have a neat feature where you could actually type in your address, and this would be uh, perfect for your consultants to type in the address and to figure out whether you're in a floodway or FEMA zone. Very important because that's going to be critical for your design of the of the of your pad elevation. So, if you click on here, there's a lot more information in there. Uh, the next uh, milestone is preparing plans. Um, that's hiring your design professionals, whether it's an architect, whether it's a, it's an engineer. As Eric mentioned earlier, we are encouraging all of you not to wait until the debris is removed, but start already that process. Start already communicating with uh, with planning as Andrew mentioned with the fire department moving forward with those plans as you as you will wait for for maybe for Cal recycle to remove the debris for you or if you have your contractor that's doing the debris removal for you we uh, we're encouraging you to already start working on on those plans with your design professionals uh, we're some of the departments that we're encouraging, and especially in, in LA County Unincorporated, as, as Andrew mentioned earlier, it's important to already start communicating with, with planning. They're, they're the department that sets the requirements for height setbacks. Uh, in, in the county, if you build like for like, there's going to be a lot of benefits for, for the rebuild process. We also have uh, public health uh, that you could communicate if, in case you have a septic system. They'll help you through the cert recertification of the existing septic system. Uh, on our website, too, we have a link to the planning department that takes you uh, if you're interested in temporary housing. That's something that a lot of people cannot wait uh, a year, year and a half living out uh, off site from their property. So uh, regional planning on the, the unincorporated area has that ability to allow you to have temporary housing on your property. And that, that's a process you have to go through regional planning for, for approvals. Uh, so then the next phase is uh, obtaining permits. Obtaining permits, it's really the submittal of plans to the building department, to regional planning. The building department is the clearinghouse, which I'm sure it's uh, similar to, to uh, the city of Malibu, where we're waiting for all, we're gonna be awaiting for all the department clearances, all those, those approvals that Andrew spoke about for planning, for fire department, for in our case, public health, if you're in the unincorporated area, if you're on a septic system. So we're gonna be looking for all those approvals prior to us issuing that permit. Of course, more critical one is the debris removal. I wanna make sure that the debris removal has been cleared either through Cal Recycle or your contractor. Uh, the, the milestone number five is uh, the construct and inspect. Uh, also on our website, we have a link to the contractor's board. Uh, to verify the contractor's information, uh, their background. Uh, so that we have that link there for you to, to verify that. And then from there, you're ready to construct. But there's factors, of course, uh, involved in uh, some, some, uh, some setbacks. And what I mean setbacks is, uh, for example, uh, in, during the, the phase of, uh, plant of, uh, of your design professional, sometimes the design professionals can take a little bit longer to, to return those, plan those plans back to us. But we're committed to to reviewing those plans over the counter every time they come back for a recheck. So that's something that we're going to do on a on a on an appointment basis. So that's something that the you, that you have the ability to move forward and push those those uh, plans forward, as well as with with uh, the inspection part of it. We also have virtual inspection that we've implemented in the unincorporated county. Whereas uh, if, if there's a lot, there's an item that needs to be picked up by the contractor that's missing. That's something that our inspector can do via Skype, or they could take a picture of the item that needs to be picked up and, and finished by the contractor. So we have that ability to move those the construction as well forward uh, as, as fast as possible. And of course, milestone six is the move-in. That's when you receive the final sign-off from our inspector. You get your certificate of occupancy. 
What we also have in the back is uh, also a timeline of, of everything that I just spoke about, the, the milestones. And you can see here down below where we're encouraging all the property owners and the design professionals already to start working on those plans with their design professionals, with their architects, communicating with, with the building department, with, uh, with the fire department. So, so you can look at this uh, timeline. Right now we're estimating a timeline of uh, 18 to 24 months complete the process. Again, that all varies. It depends on where you're at with your design professional uh, uh, in hiring your contractor. But we're committed, just like the city of Malibu, and streamlining the process and moving those plans forward, pushing them forward, and also with the inspection phases as well. Uh, with, in the unincorporated county, I just came back from a rebuild workshop. We, you could go to the same, same website, and that's uh, dbw.ldcounty.gov forward slash rebuild, and you can actually sign up for for the workshops. Uh, we have workshops uh, on Saturdays between now and all the way to the end of uh, May. So that's something that we we set up with all the four permitting departments, that's public health, uh, regional planning, fire, and public works, where we have a package that's already has all the site-specific uh, attributes for each property, and you go and you go to each department and you you discuss uh, the specifics of your property so there's still openings available if you're interested or if you haven't signed up and again this is for the unincorporated area i know the city of malibu has that available during the week as well so that's been working very well because there's an opportunity there for the property owner to go along with the design professional and seek that advice uh, seek that guidance that they so much need so that's what's uh, what's happening. I'm I'm available also to take any of your questions afterwards. I appreciate your time. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Juan. Okay, now if you if you've got your handout handy, the rebuilding after a natural disaster. Let's talk a little bit more specifically about uh, hiring of contractors. One of the things that the contractors board has been very aggressive in, in being out in the fire areas. You probably saw some of these, you've probably seen some of these signs you see behind me posted through the area. We've got hundreds of signs that we put up in the days and weeks in the aftermath. And there's a couple warnings. One is, is to you as the homeowners to be aware of unlicensed or unscrupulous contractors that may prey upon you. Uh, it, it's, it's very common that they come into the disaster area, some from out of state. So if you haven't already been hit upon by them, be aware that there are people who are not really professionals out there or people that are just solely looking to take advantage of you. And with the information that we're kind of empowering you with here, plus everything that, that you're getting from either the county or the city here, and the processes that are in place, they're really going to help protect you because it's very doubtful that some of these unprofessional professional or unlicensed people are going to be able to get through the process and all the checks and that we have here. But to be aware of that, and also you can see the other signs uh, here warning the unlicensed contractors because there is a disaster declaration here in this area. Anybody that we catch contracting without a license can potentially face a felony charge. Normally um, in, in that world that we operate in, it's a misdemeanor criminal charge, but because of the declaration, it can be a felony charge. And you should also be aware that if you choose to hire an unlicensed contractor. The only way that you can legally do that is if you're actually their employer, which means you'd have to have workers' compensation insurance. You have to pay payroll taxes. So in, unless that's something you're familiar and comfortable with, I would really urge you, if nothing else that you take away from here today, besides the fact you're not alone here, but do not look for somebody who is not licensed to be doing the kind of work. There's a lot of risks that you're going to be taking, a lot of responsibilities that you'll take on. We'd really encourage you to make sure that the contractors you're hiring are, are properly licensed to be doing this work. And we'll talk about some of the, the things that you should definitely be doing to, uh, to, to make sure you're hiring the right people to, to take care of you. We'd hate to see you be victimized a second time by having a bad experience during the rebuild process. It's tough enough as it is already. On page one, you see we talk about the type of contract. I'm not going to get into a lot of depth here, but this is something you just need to be aware of and you'll want to deal with either the city of Malibu or, or the county and figure out, is your project going to be a home improvement project or is it going to be a new construction? Now, it's pretty cut and dry if your home was destroyed. It, it's going to be new construction. But if you still have you know, a partially damaged home or there's, there's still pieces of it, there's a chance that the contractor's board, as far as a contractor, may consider a, a, a home improvement job 
and the city or the county might consider it a new construction. The only thing that the reason why it is, and we talk about it here where it says note, is there's different contract requirements for those two different kinds of jobs. So just be aware. Some of them, uh, home improvement contract limits things like down payments and puts other, other payment things in place. New construction does not have those, but usually because they're being financed, the bank is gonna, there's gonna be some controls that are in place. So just be aware and, and figure out which type of, of contract you're going to need. Now, as far as when you start looking for a contractor, I wanted to let you know about a couple of services. On the Contractors Board website, we've got uh, one that's called Find My Licensed Contractor. And, and if you actually look, um, it's the sixth page down. This, it shows what that feature is like. And what you can do here is you can put in the license classification. If you're looking for a general building contractor, that's called a B classification. You could search for all the B licensed contractors, let's say in Malibu, you could put the, that is in the city, and it'll, it'll come up with a list that shows all the contractors who are licensed uh, as their address of record in Malibu in that classification. Now you may have to, you know, if you're in Agora Hills or Calabasas or somewhere else, you may want to search for, you might have to expand into a separate search to get that, but that can at least get you a list of contractors who are currently licensed in that classification. I would urge you to be aware if you're going to any of the, the I don't want to call it any single ones, but the Home Advisor, Angie's List type companies that have out there as like referral services is to be aware they don't always have licensed contractors. Sometimes there are unlicensed contractors on there. We would say that, you know, don't, I would never say don't use them, but don't let them be your only way of checking on or assuming that a contractor is legitimate because you find them from that service. Check some of the other things which I'm going to talk about here. But when you do do the contractor's board search there, you will know that only licensed contractors will come up on that list. Okay, we'd also suggest that when you do are looking for contractors is get a bids from at least three licensed contractors and you wanna make sure that you don't necessarily just take the lowest bid if it's the same kind of job. You wanna make sure they're giving you bids for the, the same specific things. You'll find that if these are reputable contractors who know how to bid a job, you're gonna find that the prices are gonna be somewhat similar. There's gonna be differences here and there, but they're gonna be somewhat similar. Don't just go with one if it's, it's substantially lower. There's gotta be some, some reason you have to ask yourself, why can they do it for so much cheaper than somebody else? They're gonna either use inferior products, maybe they don't have insured workers, and there's other ways they're cutting corners that put you at risk. So you wanna make sure that you're, um, that you're looking at, at, at apples to apples. You also wanna ask for their pocket license. You wanna see it, all contractors have a pocket license. It's a plastic card about the size of a credit card. It's got their license number, it shows what classification. You wanna ask them to see that. You wanna make sure they're licensed. You don't want somebody saying, yeah, I'm working under my cousin's license. It's think of it like your driver's license. Nobody can drive with your driver's license unless they're a bona fide employee of that contract and they can't work under their somebody else's license. So be suspect of anybody who says they're working under somebody else's license. And you definitely want to get references from them and don't just call them up on the telephone. They could be setting you up with you know friends of theirs that say, yeah, I'm a customer of theirs. Yeah, he did this great work for me. You actually want to go out and see the work. Make sure that they uh, you know know what they're doing. Make sure that, you know talk to the homeowners. Make sure they're happy. Ask them questions like, did they show up on time every day? Were there any surprises? When they did change orders, did, was everything done in writing? Um, did they do what they say they were gonna do? Did they clean up the debris at the end of the day? Those kinds of things. You wanna ask what the process was like. Chances are, if, if they were treated and had a good experience, that you're gonna have a good experience as well. As far as the contract, you do wanna make sure it's in writing. Uh, and frankly, there are contractors, some of them get into the business because they're really good with their hands. They're really good workmen and craftsmen. They may not be the best business people. By law, they are required to give you a contract in writing, but you, you need to be aware of that and need to be aware of what's in the contract because I'd be lying if I said all contractors do it perfectly. Um, so you wanna be aware of that. Um, lean releases is another area that as you get into your um, your job that you wanna be aware of, is throughout the process, there's gonna be different stages, different milestones. We talked about milestones in, in, the, in the process. Uh, of building, you're gonna have those too, and you're gonna to wanna to make sure your payments are tied to those, those, those points. By law, contractors cannot charge you money for work before the work is done, or for materials before those materials are delivered to the job site. So you wanna be sure that you know, money is your best leverage. You don't want the money to get out in front of the work. 
So when they do us, you want to have the contract spelled out when you get done with A, B, and C to my satisfaction, I will pay you X amount of dollars. When you get done with D, E, and F, I will pay you this amount of dollars. Don't start paying for D, E, and F while they're still doing A, B, and C. And also when you do have the contract, the contractor is agreeing to do it for the price that they agree to. If they come back to you a couple months later and say, the prices of the materials have gone up, I need to get this money from you now and change everything, you've got a signed written contract from them. Don't let the contractors come in and change things on you um, because you do have a contract. They've agreed to do it for that price. There will be situations where you might uh, decide that, that you want something else done or you want to do something that wasn't included in the first contract. That's called a change order. You want to make sure you have a, a change order done in writing that both you and the contractor sign. In addition, I'm going to be doing this for you, and it's going to cost and have the breakdowns and things that you agree to in writing. The biggest problems that we see when there's an issue with a contractor and a, and a consumer and a homeowner is when something isn't in writing and it's like he said that, and I said I was going to give you this. No, you said you were going to give me that. You don't want to set yourself up where you have to kind of argue from memory or try to, to convince potentially a, a civil court that you had something you want to get it in writing that protects both you and it protects the contractor too. So it's really clear what both of you have agreed to. Lean releases is at those different points in your project. When you've made those payments, you want to have them give you a, a release which says that yes, they've agreed that you've paid that and it gives away their lien rights. Contractors are, it's been a lot that's been in place for over a hundred years that it gives them the ability to file a lien on your property if you don't pay them for the work they do. So by signing this lien release, they're agreeing that you've paid them and they're giving up their lien rights on you. And you want to be really aware of that, especially if subcontractors are going to be used. So when you're talking to the contractors up front, find out if they're going to be doing the work themselves with their own employees, if they're going to be hiring subcontractors. Most contractors are probably going to have subs do some of the jobs, whether it be an electrician, a plumber, or different pieces of the jobs. You want to find out up front who those people are. You want to make sure they're licensed as well. And when they get done with that portion of the job, you want to get a lien release from them because another thing, a pitfall you don't want to fall, you don't want to pay the contractor and the contractor doesn't turn around and pay the subcontractor. Then the subcontractor files a lien on the property because he has to get paid, then you end up having to pay twice for that, that part of the job. Again, I'm kind of just touched on the top. So we have a lot of stuff on our website about mechanics liens, but it's something that's a term you should be aware of. And, and we have forms on our website that your contractor can download. Let them know about it if they don't know about it. But it's there and it, it's available to you. Make sure your contractor pulls all their permits as it was talked about. It's a good thing to have, make sure they've got a relationship with the building departments. Bring them with you. Uh, when they come out to do the building inspections, if you're able to, try to be there. So. There's a, a good line of communications, you, your contractor, and the, the building officials. It'll help really smooth the way as you get through the process. Okay, if you can look at, at page three, I'm just going to kind of quickly go over some of the things on our website as far as services when you're checking out the contractor. When you go to our homepage, which you see there is cslb.ca.gov, on the right column, you're going to see something called our instant license check. Now, if you happen to find a contractor or you, you've got somebody who you want to check out their license status, they're going to have either a six or seven digit. We, a couple years ago, we went over our millionth licensed contractor, so we added another digit to the license. So you're going to see either a six or seven digit contractor license number. That's the best way to check it because you might have a, you know, 25 or 30 John Smith constructions in California because the state's so big. So you certainly can look them up by their names, but the license number is the best way to look them up. They're required to have it in any kinds of advertising. So if you get a business card from them, it should have their license number on it. If you see their number on the side of a truck, it should have a license. Look for a contractor's license number on there. Um, if you get a, a, a bid or proposal from them, it should have their contractor's license number on the top. So you want to be sure you check that out. On our website, you can also search by business name or the personnel name. Again, not as good because there's many people with the same names and even companies with the same names. So you can check on the homepage with typing the number in or you click that search button and you can check by the business or personnel name. Right under that is the feature I talked about earlier, the Find My Licensed Contractor, where you can build your own list of contractors. If that's what you want, go to the homepage, click on that search button, and you'll do that. Some other popular pages on our homepage you'll see. If you get to the situation, and hopefully you won't, where you need to file a complaint, you can go right to the, the information on that. We also have a disaster help center where we've got a one stop with a lot of our you know, disaster tips and we actually have a 25 minute video that's on there too that you can watch, it kind of leads you through the process. 
and we have our, our links to our various guides and publications. Now, when you actually pull up a license, if you switch over to page four there, and this is the information that you're gonna really wanna look for as you look through the page. At the top of the page there, you're gonna see the contractor's license number. I'm sorry, that's a little bit small, but you'll see the number to make sure that's the person you're looking at. The first thing you're gonna see is the business information where you're gonna see the company name, you're gonna see their address of record, and you're gonna have a phone number. Don't be shocked if that phone number might be different than the one you're dealing with. You might be dealing with a guy with a cell phone, and this might be a business office, but um, there might be a disconnect there. Also, you can see in this case, it's a, a corporation. It just says the type of business entity that a, that a company is. The date that their license was issued and their expiration date. You're gonna to wanna to make sure that expiration date hasn't passed. So if you got somebody whose license expired in March of 2019, below it, you're gonna see, here it's actually in green where it says the license is current and active. If it's an expired license, that's gonna show up in red. But you wanna make sure that your contractor has a current license in good standing. Now, in this area where it says the license is current and active, if there was some kind of disclosure information that we had, either we'd taken some kind of administrative action against the contractor, maybe we were in the process of actually trying to revoke their license, this is where you're gonna see that information. If you look to the left there in that little orange box, it says uh, addi additional status, click here for complaint disclosure information. Now, if, you, if that comes up on one of your license checks, you definitely wanna click on that. You wanna find out what's happened. It may have been a citation. Citations, I believe we disclosed them for five years, so it may have been a citation for something minor. You'll look, it'll have the information there. You wanna find out what it is. If you see something that says like pending legal action, something like that, that, that might be a little more cause for concern. You may wanna to go to the next contractor that you're researching, but that's definitely, if you see that, if you don't see that exact thing there, it says click here for complaint disclosure information. There's no information that we have that's disclosable now on this contractor. Doesn't mean that we may not have complaints against them or issues. It means that by law, we can only disclose complaints when they get to a certain age where we believe there's been some violations. We're gonna take action. We've had a citation against them. Then we can disclose it. Just because somebody has a complaint filed against them doesn't mean that we can disclose it. It also doesn't mean that they're not potentially a good contractor. We, we don't expect contractors never to have a complaint filed against them. Um, but it's what they do after the complaints filed. Do they try to get it worked out? Is it just a paperwork thing? Is it a small issue that can be dealt with? So don't necessarily you know, hold that against them. Try to find out what it is. But if it's something serious, you do definitely want to be aware of it. The next section down says classifications. This is where we have over 40 different classifications that contractors can get licenses. I mentioned things like electricians, plumbers, landscapers, swimming pool. Your general contractors, it'll say, as you see on, on this list there, it's, I'm sorry, it's small. It's the first one says A, general engineering contractor, B, general building contractor. It happened to be this licensee holds a lot of different classifications. Chances are uh, you're gonna be looking for somebody, in some cases, maybe an A, if you've got engineering parts of it. If you're on a hillside, you may be looking for parts of your job. You might be looking for a, an engineering contractor. Most of you will be looking for building general building contractors. That's probably half of our licensees hold a general building contractor license classification. So that's where you'll see the classifications. You can click on those. They can give you an, a rundown of what that classification entitles them to do. The information below that about their bond, all contractors are required to carry a $15,000 surety bond yeah, 15,000 is not gonna go a long way, um, but it's there, they're, they're required to have that. You might wanna think of, and there's information towards the end of this that talks about other things like performance bonds and other bonds that aren't required, but you might wanna think about it because they do help protect you, and it's gonna add a little bit more to the cost of the job, but it guarantees that things will get done to pass code. So you should just read through that and be aware of the different bonds. Contractors required to carry a $15,000 surety bond. The workers' compensation insurance, another critical place to look at, Contractors by law either have to do one of two things. They have to file a form with us that says they have no employees and they're exempt from having workers' compensation insurance. All companies, doesn't matter if they're a florist, if, uh, what kind of a business, if they have employees, they have to have insurance to cover them if they get injured. So they either have to give us a form that says they have no employees, therefore they don't need it, or their carrier needs to provide us with their workers' comp policy information. So you're gonna see one of those two things. So as you're talking to your potential contractors, you ask them, are you going to, is this your crews? Are you, your guys going to be doing the work? Yes, they are. Let me see, let me see your workers' comp policy. Let me get the information on there. Make sure that they're covered. If not, and somebody gets hurt while on, they're on your property, they potentially could come after you for their medical bills. And, and certainly we don't want you to, to be in that kind of a situation. So workers' comp is critically important. Don't hesitate to if you want to contact the company and make sure that they've got a, an appropriate policy 
some some sheets. Some say that they've got six office workers and they're actually out there working in the field to try to do it to, to get the lower premiums. You want to call call the insurance company. The information is going to be here. The contact information there. Check and make sure. Ask the contractor to give you a copy of his policy. Talk to him about it. Any contractor who's going to hide that from you or not want to be up front, go to the next one. The good contractors. They are happy to tell you. They, they compete against unlicensed and people that are cutting corners every day. They welcome the opportunity for a homeowner who asks them to see it because they want to prove to you that they are good, professional, and, and will do quality work for you. So that, that's what you see for the workers' comp. And then the last thing at the bottom is we have a personnel list and other licenses. Now, we list the personnel who are on the license. There's not a list of all workers. You, you, these are only the people who are in, responsible for the company. In some cases, it's a sole ownership. You'll probably only see one name on there. If it's a corporation, you'll see the, a person who's called the qualifier for the license, and you might see the other officers for the, for the corporation. So you're not going to see all the workers there, but those are the key people, especially if you see a little letter next to it which shows that they're the qualifier. All licenses have to have a qualifier, somebody who takes the tests, who qualifies to, with the experience to get a contractor's license. Those are the key people we go to if there's ever a complaint filed. So know that those are the key people in the company you're dealing with, even if you're not talking to that person. And the other thing to be aware of is there's something called home improvement salespeople, which you would see on, on this list as well. Contractors can have salespeople that, that do the sales calls, sign the contracts on their behalf. Those people do have to be registered with the contractor's board. They undergo the same criminal background checks that the contractors undergo. So if you've got somebody besides the people you see on this license negotiating with you and having you sign the contract, ask them to see their home improvement registration card. They get a plastic card as well. If, if they don't have it or they're not registered, that's another sign you, you, you may want to be aware of before you hire them. Um, okay, over on page five, um, is anybody still going through the debris removal or still, if they've opted out, they're looking to hire people for the debris? Everybody's a little bit, okay. The information you see there on page five is, is just the license classifications that are allowed to do debris removal. And we've got, I think, another uh, handout in there. So if you're looking to, to do that, make sure that the contractors you have are, are licensed in the right classification to do that. And, and obviously because they have to work through the, the city and county as far as having the, their um, approved work plans and stuff in place, that, that's going to help catch the problems. But make sure you, you, you have somebody who's qualified to actually be doing that work with all the, you know, the asbestos and chemicals and things. You, you don't want that to be done wrong because you don't want to have problems down the road after you've rebuilt on top of something and then have a problem which you may have to then go back down to the ground or down, especially in cases with your foundations, things. Okay, next page on page six, that's the find my license contractor I mentioned. On the page seven, that's the, de the debris removal information. And the last thing I wanted to briefly mention is we do regular sweep operations where we have uh, our contractors board staff along with other partner agencies it might be deployment development department department of insurance other groups that are going out and going up to the active construction sites making sure people are properly licensed they've got everything in place all their insurance and their paperwork the other thing we do is to, to identify unlicensed contractors trying to get work is we conduct undercover sting operations where we're actually will pose as a homeowner and we'll invite people who are advertising who we suspect might be working trying to get rebuilding jobs. The toughest thing that for us to do a sting operation is to get a property to use. So uh, I always put out the appeal. If, if it doesn't work out for you, that, that's absolutely fine. But if there's any situations where you would be willing to work with us to allow us to use your property for a day or two, we'll give you some money for it. Not a lot, but, but a few hundred dollars. But if we, if we could use the property to pose as a homeowner to try to get the people that we're attracting, that, that are trying to attract that business so we can you know, we can get them out of here. So if you're available, there's contact information there. We, we, would, we would appreciate that. The other thing is we'd appreciate is if you get any flyers or people are contacting you and you're suspicious about whether there might be license or not, we'd encourage you to keep that information, either take photos of it or maybe even save it to us, get in contact with us and get that information to us. Those are the people that are go into our sting file that we're going to try to get out to operations. So we'll try to find those people, weed them out and and get them out of this area, get them in jail, potentially. So anything you can do to help us have our eyes and ears to make sure that we can catch these people that are out here trying to prey upon you and your, and your fellow homeowners who are, are going through so much right now. So those are the main things now. We're going to go ahead and open things up, and we'll have all of our other um, partners here. 
ends. Josh is pointing. Oh, yes, great. Thank you. Rejoin us this afternoon. So thank you, Skylar, for being here. Uh, we're going to go into questions, but if you wanted to say anything. Yes, yeah, so if anybody has any questions for, for any of us, we're happy to take them. And, and for Skylar as well, he's, uh, who actually is a, a contractor, not putting in a pitch for his business, but, uh, but he's real knowledgeable about this area and really take advantage of, of all the resources that are here. Let me start here, sir. No, I wouldn't say that. He, he is, as long as he's legally licensed to do it, that, that is okay. Hopefully, if this is a job that's already been finished and is done words. Well, then it's good you've dodged a bullet because nobody got hurt. And they said those things cover people if they get hurt. And things. So, so the contract's okay. If they, got the, they can pull building permits, they can get the inspections. Well, sure. Well, one thing you might want to consider was the job within the last four years. If, if it is, we have, a, we have a jurisdiction for up to four years from the, the date of the contract. So you've got the opportunity, if you'd like to, to file a complaint with the contractor's board. Okay. Well, the, the, that that may not entirely be true just on the surface. I mean, they could they could cover people with insurance, and they're still not competent workers. So there may be a little disconnect there. But certainly, as far as their license goes, as we are a, a regulatory agency, we have control over that license. We can certainly take action against that license for them not covering their employees. So there may be some administrative things that we can do with them. Um, I'm not sure there's a, a complete connection on the, the competence of them just because they don't have insurance. Well, absolutely. And it, it is one of the things as you go into this process, you want to ask them, you know, you want to be very specific about, you know, are you using your own staff or these, ask them, are these, you know, people that are competent to do this, what kind of job? That's why you want to talk to you know, people who've had that work done as well. Did, did one, one thing as a homeowner, it's, it's oftentimes important um, to obviously check the license of the people that are working for you before they start work on your property. But you can do the CSLB.gov. .ca.gov. .ca .gov. But also to um, Make sure that if, if you want and you're concerned about that, make sure that you get a certificate of liability insurance in advance and workman's comp and make sure that they, they can provide you that cert. Hey, okay, sir. Question for Eric on debris removal on the state removal program. Wait, we, oh, there's there. Just going to select which lot they select. Random. How can we tell when our lives is targeted to debris removal? Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, each, each, region like the whole region is broken up into a bunch of little access routes right and so kind of each little canyon or access route has assigned a task force and that task force is basically handling that group of streets that are all together um, that community so you can't overload one little street with five degree removal crews that would be insane so you have one that'll work from from one to the next and so the way it it, it ends up um getting prioritized and onto the list is based on the assessments. And the assessment teams go out, they assess it for safety hazards, asbestos, and, and things of that nature. If it requires further testing, we'll let it go into a, a, a little later, right? And the ones that are all cleared and ready to go get moved up to the top in a continuous fashion. And each task force has a, a, a list of houses that are coming up and one might switch places and go down or up and down on the list depending on how those approvals went um, for the assessments. Is any of that information available to the homeowner? Um, you can. You can. I recommend uh, calling the, the operations center. They have, uh, they have access to all this information. Um, usually if you call our hotline, we'll look it up or we'll refer you to the, to the um, operations center. And if you want, I have a phone number for you yes, um, to, to help you track 
the, the progress there. Most of the calls nowadays that we get are about where are we at in the process. Right. Um, and, and we can tell you, you know, yeah, the debris has been removed, but we're waiting for soil results, things like that. I mean, we have access to all that information. Um, so let's get you the number here. Okay. 747 259 0352. How, how much notice will the homeowner get when the property is identified? Well, first there's assessments, and there's not really a notification uh, uh, set up for that. So when the teams are going to go out and assess your property, but you are supposed to get a, a one to two days um, a notice before the crews actually mobilize and show up on your property with heavy equipment and all of that. And, and we can also, if you uh, make a request, we can make sure that you get a, a little advance notice. We'll put a little note on there to get a little bit further notice. How, how do we make that request? It's at the same number right there. Okay. It's at the same number. Uh, I typically, it's a, it's a matter of making a call. I write an email, send it in to the, to the folks. By the end of the day, the homeowner and, the, and um, everybody's notified and, oh, we, we, we understand that they're going to Europe for a couple of weeks and we'll, we'll be in touch with them uh, at least two weeks in advance before, you know, for this special case. The actual operation, once they actually move onto your property, uh, two to three days off. Uh, it's the assessments take a long time, the follow up and getting the soil results back and that might not clear the first time. So they have to go scrape a little bit more material and then retest. Those things take time. And of course, each one of these is a different crew with a different list that they're working off of. And so um, inevitably there's a, well, and we just had one today, yesterday. And she said, well, I drove by there and the debris was already removed on, on Thursday night. So why aren't they sampling it for soils on Friday? And it's, we have this huge operation. We're clearing, uh, we're working on 50, 60, 80 properties at a time. You know, we have 30 crews, 30 teams out working on these properties. And so there's a process set up where once it's completed, this portion is completed, and then they're officially transferred to the next crew that's going to go and do the next task. And so uh, it's a big process. What's your target for completing? I believe we're in shock in the uh, middle of June. Middle of June. So other questions? I, was there another one over here real quick? Good question. Uh, I got called like six weeks ago that I got called on, on the list six weeks ago that they're not coming clean. And so far they canceled me three times. Oh, Every no. time they give me a different excuse. I mean it's been six weeks and terrible. I don't know why and they just I don't know, they just don't get exactly why. Mm. Super frustrating. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm not aware of it. I mean, specifically, I don't know. If you want to talk afterwards, and I'll get your information, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. Okay. That's not. I've heard that from other people too. So I know it's concerning, and they eventually get an answer. So. Yeah. And especially, hopefully, I'll be able to help. Um, we work Monday through Friday, and. I work out of town, I need to stay out of town, right? So I don't have access to the limited power hours that you guys have for Frenchia. Um, that's a good suggestion. I'm just going to say, as a council member, a suggestion for me is if you write an email to us. Right. Because I've thought about us maybe trying to get something open on the weekend exactly. for people there's like yourself. Because I've heard that from a lot of people. Is, I mean, but is the city going to be. I don't, I don't know, but if we get enough requests for that, I, I think it's something that could better serve the community. Right. Yeah, two weeks ago, we did have a workshop here at City Hall on a Sunday for property owners, and we have all the outside agencies and departments here to go through this. That's why we're here on Saturday right now, too. Can we get sign offs on stuff like this? I can't answer that directly. It would have to be the entire council. I'm only one person. But I tell you that you're not the first person that I've heard it from, and uh, we need to make that, we need to do better to serve you. And then a question on temporary housing application. Um, one, instead of uh, having to pay some California Edison to put in a power panel and a meter uh, that can go solar, is the 
to see off the grid. Solar. Um, and then the second question is uh, septic. Can we do a compost in the toilet and uh, incinerating the toilet instead of going septic? Uh, so I'll take those in turn. And I don't think we've received any applications yet for solar, but the building official did say he's willing to look into that. Yes. If, you know, how is that well, look into that? that well, let, let, so let me answer that sort of also as from an electrical contractor's point of view for a second, if that was maybe offer, because I've got a lot of questions from people in the community about this. When you go to rebuild your house, right, at whatever point that is in the future, you're probably going to need a certain power source that may or may not be solar. Now, there are units that are available that can generate enough power to power certain tools and then other things that don't, and some guys drive around with generators, but... I don't think that the neighborhood wants a bunch of gas and diesel power generators running 24 seven to power all these construction sites. So a solar option is great. We need to work that out internally. But the other part of it is if the power panel gets put on as a temp power pole, once you get approval for that site for whatever that structure is or temporary structure, you would be able to use that during your construction and you have adequate power on site so that you're already set up for that. So how that sort of works is you get approval for that from the city, right? And then also from Edison. So earlier in the meeting, which was with contractors, our, well, I'd say my goal, because again, I'm only one of five, is for our community to get more areas with underground power. And if you know me, you know that I've been working on that since I first got elected in 2012, right? And that's a, so there's a lot of different things at play with that. But as you go to rebuild, you can get overhead temporary power. You can also apply and get underground temporary power. It's the same depth of a trench, right, for underground, whether it's permanent or it's temporary. You can put in larger conduit that you can use that later for your home and run your low voltage, your communications, and that all at the same time. And it's much easier to do when you have a bare dirt or dirt and foundation site. So I'm, I'm offering that to you to say that if you plan that out properly as a homeowner or a property owner, you can probably wind up doing it more efficiently in the long term. Because that's a, that's, that's a, a cost sometimes as an electrical contractor, people come to me and say, oh, how much is it to go underground? Oh, well, you know, you're, you own four acres. It's, you know, pretty expensive because... We have to, you know, like if you were going in the city of LA and they require you to do all that work, they're like $500 a foot. Okay, well, I got to run, you know, 1,500 feet of power. That's that all of a sudden that gets very expensive, you know? So yeah. anyways, once you get approval from the city for the site, then you can move forward with power. The city's not just going to go and issue a bunch of temporary power poles because then we have RVs parked on every property in the city and it's not going to happen. Yeah. But, you know, my, my understand the constraints with solar um, our house our previous house that, that broke down was you know we had a seven and a half kilowatt uh, PV solar system that you know handled you know, everything we, we, we needed and, you know in fact even had a well that you know exactly a well anymore. so um but as far as the temporary housing you know because we're we're a little bit on time with our ALE and you know just getting on site and to get out of the line, you know uh, I'd, I'd much rather just have a self-contained solar our, look, our, our goal is to get you back to your property as soon as it's safe, cleared, everything else. So directly, please talk with Andrew. Even if you guys go back and forth on email, I mean, I'm sure we can get a planning person or someone we can arrange to do the site visit maybe on the weekend, like to, however to best accommodate you, okay? And then you have a second question about cell systems. We do want them connected. There should be an existing septic system on the property. Yes. Well, but if it's, if it's questionable, if it's not going Usable, um, I, and it's going to take some time to redesign. And, you know, we're still in the design phase of that the house, and we're not sure on the picture count and that. The, right. Yeah. If, if you have a particular problem with your project, please come and talk to me afterwards, and like, let's see what we can figure out. We're, we're, we're aware of the technology. We're, we're, you know, hey, if we can, like, go up, send someone up in a spaceship to the moon and they can live there for days on end, not, you know, they don't have a septic system that's, like, flushing and collecting all the fluid. Right. We get it, right? So... Again, the staff wants to make your process as easy as possible, and we're they're here to handle those questions and, and do with it site by site. 
Can I, uh, can I uh, chime in on this subject? Uh, we're in LA County, I'm incorporated, and uh, my name is Steve Siegel. I've talked to Mr. Mandel on the subject. We've been struggling ever since the property. We, we don't understand, and I'm sure many people don't understand why, but millions of dollars were spent by Edison to stand up the poles and get the power back in our canyons and exclude us from being there while they did it, but that they're making it virtually impossible to get power restored to our properties. So, this is the city, this is county. But um, so every step of the way we've been fighting, and I'm sure many of the other people have, our well is working on damage by the fire. We just had to reconnect it to a power source. We've had to bring water and do things like clean the site. We've had to bring water into, we've had to remove our horses and put them in a rescue because we had no water. So we're still sitting there now with this massive labyrinth of bureaucratic stuff. And Juan is trying to help me get through it. But I mean, has anybody seen the foundation reuse checklist that has to be completed? You know, it's crazy. It's long. It's real. It's, it's mind boggling. But it's also, it's also because a foundation now is of a way different standard than a foundation from 50 or 100 years ago. My foundation is actually better than it was. <laughs> it's, 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 well, for sure, it's very cured now. We know that. <laughs> no. I've been there. Uh, I was told that we got some fire by an engineer that my foundation was probably fine. Who was a friend? And then we went through all the rigmarole. But the, bo the bottom line is we just actually had tests on it and they were off the chart in terms of <laughs> So. The problem is, is why are why is county and or city? I understand you don't want our east part of the property. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll answer community. the power question. Why are we having okay. this problem with getting power if, on property? If you, you have, have for 60 years on the property. I went and got a permit last week or the week before for a home with livestock and horses. Okay. Okay. Where the well provides the water for those animals, and the animals have had to leave, and they need to return to the property. Exactly. So that's a commercial service that's for a well on a large property, which is treated differently than a residential panel, okay? So in a situation like what you're talking about where you need to get livestock there, I know in the city, there's a way to deal with that. But I don't know about the county. Yeah, in terms of the county, uh, we're working with planning to uh, coordinate a lot of the temporary uh, power uh, poles that we issue. Uh, your particular case, one of the concerns, and this goes to all the properties that have the small lots. Uh, the concern is that the debris has to be cleared prior to regional planning, exactly. that temporary housing, prior to building safety issues in that temporary particle. So, so we're, we're aware that there are situations where you have a huge lot where you need uh, agriculture, uh, you have the agriculture use. We had the new issue uh, temporary particles, uh, temporary particles for the wells. Or uh, in the in other views as related to agriculture. But that's going through our planning department. Again, for the smaller lots, it's very difficult for you to put a temporary housing on a small lot and still be far away to be safe from the So it's on a case by case. Just so you know, when I brought that up, exactly what you just said with regional, yeah. they rolled their eyes and looked at me like I was crazy. Well, they, that's. They just, they then let's get an email here, let's get to the bottom yeah, of it and get, get an answer. And we're working with uh, Mr. Siegel and uh, not sure specifically that. on the agriculture and the, I mean, the horse thing. You, you know our property. I know. I do know it. Yes. Property, so. Yeah. I mean, I, I would just say that even knowing your property and on the site that I'm talking about, where the horses are, is removed from where the damaged site was, and it's a larger, a much larger property. So I can't say like I know where your guys' home is, and like yeah. say how the wind blows when it blows offshore. It's blowing all that dust right into probably whatever is going to be on the downslope part of the property based on how the canyon is. And I know that the county would be very concerned that whoever's tending to the animals or the animals themselves or would be breathing air that's probably not what they'd want to be breathing. Yeah, that's, that's a concern. And then so it wouldn't make sense for them to say, hey, here's the power. Go ahead and put the animals there and everything else. It's a liability issue. Yeah, our type priority is uh, streamlining the process and, and the communication has been given in that. Yeah, and so that we will continue to work on a um, case by case again uh, for this situation. Yeah. Of course, a uh, case by case lines, we'll, we'll be here to answer some questions too. Um, yes, sir. I have two questions. The first question is you mentioned that conditional day of the end. Is the we, we asked to sign one before the work uh, to be signed after one also 
And second question is that when we hired the uh, architects, they wanted us to pay a retainer fee in advance. He said, don't pay. You can reverse that. Is retainer fee a standard thing? Uh, to be honest, I don't know as far as the architect, they're actually licensed. There's a, a California Architects board that licensed them. I'm not sure. I'd be happy to get your information. I can have somebody at the board get in touch with you and let you know. I'm sorry, I didn't get all, uh, the speakers aren't good right here. I didn't get the first question. Uh, the, the conditional waiver of the end? Conditional waiver release. release. Oh, okay. Before the, 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 the right, the, the, the conditional. After that also should be after yes, there should be, they, after you, uh, they receive the payment, they should sign the unconditional release. So, so the conditional release says, basically it says, when you pay this, they will waive their rights. So you want to have something that they sign the unconditional release showing that you've paid I'll explain it afterwards. Again. So if I explain it in layman's terms, because that's sort of something that for some people that have never built a home or something and are maybe going to do it themselves, um, it's a little bit difficult, right? That whole process, you got, you know, 10 different subcontractors. If you're going owner builder and you have to manage all these people and you don't want to get sued and they don't want to sue you, right? And you're, you're in this process that can be very chaotic. That's why a lot of people use a general contractor. But... Um, you'll want to see a conditional release, which is something that the contractor will sign in order to get paid. Um, and then they'll release, give you another release back when they receive the payment, which basically means they can no longer file a lien against your property for that work that was done. So if that better helps that. Um, so oftentimes there are two. So let's say um, I give... I'm working, I'm an electrician, I'm working on Andrew's house, okay? And I say, here's our contract, right? I'm gonna give you a new power pole, it's $5,000, $3,500. And he says, okay, we're gonna have you do the work, here's a check for $600, because that's the maximum amount I can give as an initial payment. I go and get my permits and my work, and I come and do the work. So I got a conditional release to get the $600 payment, I then gave him another release back that says I've received the payment. And then I got, however, if I work out a percentage or something else, for the next payment, I gave him another release and received the payment. And then when I received the payment, I gave him a final release back that says we're done. Okay. And I've received the payment. Now, a lot of the people that I, I work with as a contractor that I've worked with for many, many years, we don't always go through the whole lien process because it's a small amount of money or something else. And, they, they trust us in our work, right? But in terms of finding all of the legal proper paperwork, you're gonna want probably two releases from every contractor or subcontractor for every payment. So sometimes on a larger project, you know, each draw may be 100,000 or 200,000 or half a million or a million dollars, right? And this is going on consecutively month after month after month. And there's somebody that's working in the office for the general contractor and they're making sure that every sub is getting them um, unconditional and conditional releases. So the conditional release saying we need to get paid, the unconditional release saying we've received the payment, then the final release saying the job is finished, we've received our money, and it's kosher. And it's, uh, Fair enough? Fair enough. And if the contractor asks for a repayment fee, like a thousand dollar or something, it's a, I think it's capped at $600. The architect that you were talking about with a retainer fee, many architects in this area will not work unless they're on retainer. So I don't. that's between you and the architect. And for the building contractors, they are retainer fee? Well, yeah. And actually, as I talked about at the very, very beginning, part of it is, it's, is it going to be a new construction or is it a home improvement? For home improvement, if you have just a job at your house, it's 10% or $1,000, whichever is less. So in your case, if it was $3,500, actually it'd be $350, so 10%, but never more than $1,000. So it's over a $10,000 contract, you should never pay more than 1,000 as a down payment. Now when new um, construction comes into play, those laws don't apply for that. We ask contractors to follow those as a guideline, but usually the draws and things are tied in with the bank, and that's why you wanna have it spelled out in your contract when you make the payments for certain parts of the work so then when they present you with those uh, it, those lien releases and things you it follows what your contract says if, if if you're using like a loan from a bank for part of the construction or a substantial amount of the construction they're going to be very diligent in requiring all of these 
And once you get the process sort of set up with whoever the contractor is, it'll move relatively quickly. And I'll say like, maybe I'm, you know, don't want to shoot myself in the foot here, but I'm not always the best person is getting the releases up right back and forth because it gets confusing sometimes, but you have to do it. So that's, that's the other part of that, right? If, if you're doing the job, like I'm not going to get paid until I get the release, right? And then they're not going to give you the next payment until they receive both the new conditional release and the unconditional release from the previous work order or invoice. We're like uh, Martin and Lewis here. And then, <laughs> then the other thing is to remember too, is if they don't, there's actually time limits and deadlines on them to get you those forms. If they don't, don't quote me, I believe it's 20 days. So if they don't do it within a certain window they have, then they lose their rights. Read up on it. There's lots of information on our website. There's lots of information around it. It can be very confusing, but it's something you definitely want to be aware of and you want to make sure you hold your contractor to the fire there uh, and make sure you get those releases. Yeah. Actually, we actually have another contractor I see in the back of the room raising his hand. You can... Yeah, um, I am the general contractor and I, I want the gentleman who asked the question to understand I never send out an invoice without including a, a conditional uh, lien release on the receipt of that invoice. I have that two pieces of paper with the invoice. The first is the invoice, the amount being requested, and a conditional lien release. You should also receive the second, which is a, an unconditional release on a progress payment, the moment that that contractor that check through the bank. And I, I never break that rule. I will not have any subcontractor pay who doesn't give that to me as a general. Even though I might represent the client for all of the money, no one gets paid unless I have those papers in advance. I also want you to know I have 14 days in which to initiate payments. In other words, if I, everybody gets billed on the seventh of the month, they don't get their checks until the 21st. It gives everybody some clarity of time. Hope that helps. Yeah. Again, that kind of goes to the point, too, of making sure to hire a professional who does this kind of stuff. Don't get the run-of-the-mill guys. They have no idea what a lean release. So you think you don't know what a lean release is? There's a lot of people out there who have worked in this industry that don't know it. So make sure you're empowered, you have these questions, and if they don't have the right answers for you, move on to the next one. We've got a few more back here. Oh. I'm out of the but thank you. After we have our uh, debris removed, yeah. how long can we, uh, before we can inspect the pilot center? Um, well, it depends. By the SAFE program? Yeah. Oh, the SAFE program? If that one depends. Uh, after the debris is cleared, you're scheduled for soil testing. Yeah. Get the results back, which usually takes a, a, a one to two weeks to get it back. Once that's done, the next step is erosion control. Now that might take a, a month or two to schedule and, and finally get the crews out there to do that. You have the option to waive erosion control so that once you get once they get the soil results back, you immediately get that final sign off and, and then you're ready to go. All right. And that, that uh, erosion control waiver is available at the at the operation center in Calabasas. Yes, exactly. Okay, yeah, yeah, we're over on time, but we'll yeah. maybe just take a couple more questions or we could just, people can come up. Feel free, you won't be rude to us if you guys want to get up and go. We'll take just the last couple of questions or if some people want to get, get us to the side, we're happy to talk with you as well. Uh, my question is to assembly number, Richard. Um, I signed into the uh, safe uh, removal program, didn't have insurance, um, every agency, everyone who's involved in this, they came for inspection uh, every, from the same agency two days before the contract of moved them to remove the removal as uh, agreed. Um, we have a special situation. We have 37 acres on a private road to the to the debris. It's about 3,000 feet long and uh, it's, it's pretty wide, 26 feet wide. Uh, they move then the third day, they move the equipment, they move the equipment the next, the next day. All the equipment was added, roll of equipment that pretty much dug up the road, damaged this, and they turned the damage and the underground uh, drainage. But then the, the middle of the second day, they decided that they didn't want to do the job. 
they put a condition that they will not use drugs, therefore uh, they, they will not do the job, they will do the job. To make the whole story short, where do we go from here? I know I talked to uh, Eric and, and he offered that the county, you know, I can up to the county program. I, I signed it with the state program. I feel that I'm entitled to the money that was would have been allocated for that. We I'm a licensed contractor as well. I could do the job, I could hire somebody else to do the job we needed. We're looking for an reimbursement since they didn't accept our offer to have another contractor as long as they can do the job and and you know and warrant that they don't get damaged by it. So I don't know the answer to that. I mean, so we don't want to look into that. Yeah. Well, and, and we were speaking earlier about yeah. this. And you were very kind, you listen, right? Yeah. And yes. I want to see what the state can do. To we want to do so the so job. I, I, can, I can follow up with this. I'm not just so I understand. Do you fully understand what you're doing? Yes. I, yes. I, I need to talk to him about this. I'm not even. Okay. And uh, what are the legal reasons for the ones who ask? I'm a contractor. Every driver, every person who buys material comes a contractor or contractor from his supplier, whatever it is, maybe that supplier delivers the material to your yard or a piece of equipment. Your home, your property, they also establish lien rights without you knowing that the equipment came from somebody over there. So the contractor, the arms contractor, are required to, to give you also a releases, new releases from the supplier of the equipment and the supplier of each type of material that was delivered into your property. And in each individual labor, labor, not only subcontractor, that work in your property. Thank you very much. All great points and thank you. So at this point, thank you again for everybody for being in here and joining us today. And we uh, be sure to take advantage of all the resources available. We know it's a long road and we appreciate the fact that you're, you're here learning what you can and to be assured that we're gonna be here with you along the way. And just a quick question. Um, these flyers we mailed out from our office, can I just get a raise of hands of who received one of these flyers in the mail? All right. Very nice. Thank you. Sure, let me just turn this one off here and then.